So the main thing I'm going to do is just briefly outline in very broad brushstrokes the specific kind of panpsychism I've defended recently in a paper called How Exactly Does Panpsychism Explain Consciousness, which is currently under peer review, which, but you, which is available on my website if people are interested in the details. Um, oh, also, I, I wrote, wrote some slides this morning, given there's been a bit of a theological theme as well, hint to this conference. I, I, I had a couple of slides on connections between panpsychism and spirituality or lack of. So starting off, is this a, I mean, and I guess this is closely connected to what Christoph's been talking about. Um, this is, is this a scientific problem? Is this a philosophical problem? Here's how I think about it. I think it's a bit of both. The reason I think it's not a straightforward, a straightforward scientific problem, because a lot of people, although it's broadly agreed now, there is this hard problem of consciousness. I think a, a very common reaction is to say, oh, well, we just need to do more science. You know, there are a lot of unfinished business in science. The reason I don't agree with that is, or at least one reason is that I think consciousness is not publicly observable, right? You can't look inside somebody's head and see their feelings and experiences. Now, science is used to dealing with unobservables, uh, fundamental particles, for example. But I think that there's an important difference here. In all other cases, I think we postulate unobservables in order to explain what we can observe. Right, fundamental particles are postulated to explain the data of public observation. In the case of consciousness, the thing we are trying to explain is not publicly observable. Right, we didn't discover consciousness in an experiment. We know it exists just through our immediate awareness of our feelings. So I think this really is a, is something quite unique and um, is constrains at least our capacity to deal with it experimentally. Now that doesn't mean, of course, I would never ever say we can't deal with experimentally and, and Christoph's given sort of a good overview of some of the cutting edge experimental work. So, so how, do we, how do we deal with it experimentally if, we, if it's not publicly observable? Well, although you can't publicly observe consciousness, you can ask people what they're feeling and experiencing um, and you can, scan their brains at the same time, or you can stimulate bits of the brain and, and ask them what they're feeling, experiencing, or, or you can start to, from interactions with people, get some clues about, about, about what kind of things are correlated with, the, with experience. And in this way, we can start to establish what has become known as, thanks, thanks largely to, to Christoph and others, the neural correlates of, of, of consciousness. We can try to work out which kinds of experience go along with which kinds of uh, physical activity. And we can try and get more systematic. So we can try and work out what in general uh, are the physical conditions necessary and sufficient for consciousness and Integrated information theory offers one one proposal, global workspace, another higher order thought, and so on. So I think of that as the, the scientific bit, but I don't think that's the full story because ultimately I think we want an explanation of those correlations. We want to we want to say why a certain kinds of physical activity go along with conscious experience. If IIT is true, why does maximal integrated information go along with conscious experience? Why should that be? What is going on in reality to make that the case? And that, that's the way we turn, I think, to the philosophical, but we just have to look at the various proposals on offer for, for because, because consciousness is not publicly observable, I don't think you can answer that question with an experiment. I think all we can do with experiments is, is establish these correlations. And then you just have to ask, well, you know, look at the different th theories philosophers have proposed for what explains why, um, what's going on real, in reality to account for the fact that certain kinds of physical activity go along with certain kinds of consciousness. I actually think IIT is actually do, doing both in a sense. It's, um, there's, there's a proposal about, um, well, I mean, Chris, Christoph is, is welcome to correct me, but as I understand it, a proposal about that maximal integrated information goes along with consciousness, but there's also, uh, Christoph and, and, and Tononi often say there's an identity. So I think at that point, you're moving to the philosophical bit and proposing an identity. Whereas someone could just take the, 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 the neural correlations bit of IIT. They could just say, um, 
you know, I think maximal integrated information is correlated with consciousness, but I give a dip, I'm a dualist or panpsychist or whatever. But insofar as, but, but proponents of IT often say there's an identity, uh, which Philip, I think- Before you move on, can I ask you one oh, question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. From your point of view, philosopher, where's the difference of the status of consciousness compared to the idea of multiverses or the idea of the quantum mechanical wave functions? Both things are in principle not observable. Neither the wave function, we can only observe when it interferes, we can never observe wave function directly, nor can we observe um, yeah. multi, uh, other universes, so called multiverses, that are outside our causal light cone. So it seems to me science has all sorts of things that it talks about that can, in principle, cannot be observed, never mind string theory. Yeah, good. So, so I would say the difference there is, I think with those things, they are postulated to explain what we can observe. So people postulate the quantum wave function because it's part of our best predictive theory. Um, obviously with the multiverse, it's, it's, it's much more controversial, but that's part of the theory of internal in, eternal inflation, which is supposed to explain why the universe is, is quite flat and other observable facts. So in all these cases, we're postulating these unobservable things to explain publicly observable data. But I think with consciousness, the, it's the unique case where the thing we are trying to explain. It, it, so I think Daniel Dennett is right, that if you're just trying to explain publicly observable data, which many people take to be the sole job of science, you would not postulate consciousness because you just postulate mechanisms to explain behavior. And that's basically Dennett's consistent project. Uh, but I think mo most of us think, no, there's this thing that's not publicly observable, but we know is real because we're directly aware of it. So, so it's in a sense an, 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 unobser an unobservable datum as opposed to a postulation. So science makes a lot of unobservable postulations, but it doesn't have any unobservable data. I think that's the difference. Okay. But okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, so the two sta uh, the two standard options that are, that are often given are um, dualism and materialism. Dualism that consciousness is non physical. Perhaps the most uh, well known example of this in in recent times is David Chalmers' naturalistic dualism. So he postulates special psycho. He thinks consciousness and the physical are totally different, but they're connected by psychophysical laws of nature. He thinks if there were just the laws of physics, we'd just be zombies. But because of these special psychophysical laws of nature, they ensure that with certain kinds of brain activity, consciousness pops up. Um, the other being materialism, that conscious states can, I mean, very roughly here, can, can somehow be explained, reductively explained in terms of physical states in something like the way you can explain wetness in terms of chemical composition. And there are well-known difficulties with both. So in terms of dualism, people have worries about it being empirically dubious because they, a lot of people defend the idea that the physical world is causally closed in the sense that everything that happens in the physical world has a physical cause. Um, and so, you know, all of my behavior and my lips moving right now has a totally physical cause. And if that's right, and consciousness is non-physical, it looks like there's nothing left for consciousness to do. It's rendered epiphenomenal, which just means, you know, it, it, it's there, but it doesn't do anything. And many people find that kind of intolerable. I, I, I'll come back to this thought because I've become, I've become more skeptical of it as time goes on. And I'd like to get the scientists views on it. But even putting that consideration aside, a more straightforward worry with dualism is it's less parsimonious than other options, right? You've got two radically different kinds of stuff instead of one. And I think the aim of science and philosophy is to, is to go, you know, the simplest theory that fits the data. Problem with materialism, huge debate here, but I think there's good arguments to think that the, the, the proposed explanation here just couldn't possibly work out. And the rough problem is that uh, physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness involves qualities, colors, sounds, smells, tastes. I think qualities that whose the character of which can't be captured in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience. You can't capture what it's like to see red 
in a purely quantitative language. So that's a kind of descriptive limitation of the vocabulary of neuroscience or physical science more generally. And I think that entails a sort of explanatory limitation because it, you know, if you wanted to explain the qualities of consciousness in a, in a neuroscientific theory, you know, reductively explain them, I mean, not just sort of establish correlations. I think you'd have to first describe them in your theory and then give your explanation in more fundamental physical terms. If you can't even describe them in the theory, uh, then I don't think you can reductively explain them in the theory. So that's why I think, although, you know, obviously neuroscience has a huge amount to offer, I don't think the, mat the, the materialist proposal works. I don't think you could reductively explain the qualities of experience. I mean, there's obviously a huge debate here and we could talk about it more. So that's why I, I, I don't, you know, I think of IIT, there's the um, scientific bit and the philosophical bit. I, I, I'm open-minded very much, and I'll give some reasons in favor of it actually in a moment on, on, the, on, on the scientific bit. But insofar as if I'm understanding it rightly, there's a there's a proposed identity between the qualities of consciousness and um, kind of quantitative stuff like integrated information. I, I, I reject that identity for these reasons. Okay, so I prefer this panpsychist option. Many of you will be familiar with it. And uh, just to, the basic idea, it's inspired by stuff Russell wrote in the analysis of matter in 1927. And the starting point is that physical science doesn't really tell us what matter is, uh, which seems like a very strange claim at first, but it actually turns out on reflection, I think that physical science is confined to telling us about the behavior of stuff, what it does. Physics talks about mass and charge, and these are completely characterized in terms of behavior, things like attraction, repulsion, resistance to acceleration. This is all about what stuff does. And then the thought is, well, intuitively at least, we could debate this point, there's more to what something is than what it does. So I often give the analogy of chess pieces. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're playing chess, you're just interested in what the pieces do, what moves you can make, what pieces you can take. But if you're someone who collects high-end luxury chess pieces, then you're interested in the substance of the chess pieces, you know, what they are in themselves, independently of what they do. So this is what we sometimes call the intrinsic nature of a thing, what it is considered independently of what it does. And about this, so coming back to fundamental particles, of course, you may very well be interested in what physics has to tell you about what an electron does, but you might also be interested in the intrinsic nature of an electron, what it is considered independently of what it does. And about this, physics just has nothing to say. So the thought is then there's this potentially this huge hole in our standard scientific story of the universe. And then the proposal is, well, maybe we can put consciousness in that hole, right? We're looking for this place for consciousness in our scientific story. We've got this hole, let's put consciousness in the hole. So the thought is, you know, there's just matter, particles, fields, nothing supernatural, but it can be described from two perspectives. Physical science tells us what it does, but in terms of its intrinsic nature, it's constituted of forms of consciousness. So, I mean, in a way on this view, there is just consciousness, uh, but that doesn't mean there's nothing physical because physics just tells us what this consciousness stuff does. Of course, if you're doing physics, you don't know that's what you're studying. So I think, uh, Physics is a bit like playing chess when you don't know what the pieces are made of. Physics is just interested in what the stuff does, but what they're actually unbeknowingly studying are forms of consciousness. All right, that's the basic view. So what's the attraction of this? Well, the hope is it evolve, avoids the problems of materialism and dualism I talked about earlier. I'm doing everything in very broad brushstrokes, but so the problems of materialism, we're not trying to get from the physical to consciousness, the, quanti the quantitative to the qualitative. So we avoid that expansion gap. And because consciousness is, is not out, is incorporated into the physical world, the hope is that it avoids those empirical concerns and it avoids the ontological profligacy of dualism. So hooray, we solved the problem. We can all go home. Unfortunately, there are some problems. Um, uh, as as the, the uh, related to the so-called combination problem, because the panpsychist ultimately the aim is that we explain human and animal consciousness in in terms of more fundamental forms of consciousness, perhaps the consciousness of particles, um, and how 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 on earth do you do that? You know, there's there's at least an explanatory obligation there. 
So broadly speaking, there are two projects here, two attempts to do this, two camps, which Gerda Hart talked about this morning. So, I, well, I've called them here emergentism and reductionism. So the emergentist postulates extra laws of nature to bridge the gap between fundamental forms of consciousness and biological consciousness. So it might just be a basic law of nature that when conscious particles organize themselves into circumstances where there's more integrated information in the whole than the parts, then you just get consciousness associated with the system as a whole. That's just a fundamental principle of nature. Um, and Hedda hassel Merck, who's actually spent um, a lot of time at, in Giulio Tononi's lab, has worked out IIT in, in that kind of emergent panpsychist framework. Reductionism so it tries to do without those extra laws of nature. They just say, no, just as having conscious particles arranged in the right way is in and of itself sufficient to get a conscious system. So Luke Roloffs is what, what the leading proponents of this. His book, Com Combining Minds, is, 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 is very good. Okay, so they're the two camps, but unfortunately, I mean, there are associated problems of each. And, and the way some people say it is, well, look, if you take the emergentist option, you get all the same problems as dualism. You get the reductionist option, you get all the same problems as materialism or physicalism. What, so you get all the same problems with, with as dualism, the emergentist, because you know if you've got these radically new kinds of consciousness popping up, and if you think the micro level is causally closed, then these new forms of consciousness, you get, what, 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 there's nothing left for them to do. They're gonna be rendered epiphenomenal. And we're trying to reduce human consciousness to particle consciousness. Many people think there's a kind of explanatory gap there. Um, we could talk about that. I don't think either of these problems are as serious as the problems facing the physicalist or the dualist, but they're important challenges. So what I've tried to develop, um, and here's I get to the, the view I've developed recently, is a sort of hybrid of the two options. I'm going to call hybrid cosmopsychism. So it's um, so it's 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 a view in a, in a in a field ontology rather than a particle ontology. So you know we tend to always think of like particles as the fundamental building blocks, but actually many theoretical physicists prefer to think that uh, universe-wide fields are the fundamental entities, and particles are sort of local excitations in fields. If you combine panpsychism with that view then you get the view that the, that the fundamental forms of consciousness are the intrinsic natures of universe-wide fields. So it's a sort of cosmopsychic view that the sort of the whole universe or these universe-wide fields are the fundamental forms of consciousness. Okay, so, and then I have a sort of a hybrid view. So it's emergentism about conscious subjects, but reductionist about their conscious states. So a conscious subject is just the thing. So I'm distinguishing between the things that have consciousness, conscious subjects or minds, if you like, and their conscious states. So it's emergentism about conscious subjects. So there are, on this view, kind of fundamental laws of nature, such that in certain circumstances, um, new conscious subjects emerge in brain-shaped regions of space. But the reductionist aspect is that these new conscious subjects don't come with their own forms of consciousness, rather they, as it were, inherit streams of consciousness from the level of basic physics, right? So the, the, the minds are fundamental. I mean, oh, I, I, I was talking about this with someone yesterday and I got a new metaphor. If you think of like the mind as a kind of glass bottle uh, and it's it's fill and, and then its contents is sort of consciousness. So the, the, the empty glass bottle appears, but it's filled up with consciousness from the level of fundamental physics. Um, okay. So, so, so just to make, so as I said, I think, I think there's a, I see the problem of consciousness as a sort of scientific bit and a philosophical bit. What I've been developing and I've given you a very, very brief, overview of I think of as a philosophical bit and that ought to be plugged in with a scientific bit right and I'm open I follow the scientific debate as best I can but I'm I I, I, I struggle with the debates about the front of the brain the back of the brain I I, I try to follow it but I, I I'm 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 a little I'm I, I'm I, I'm definitely non-committed but suppose, so suppose integrated information theory turns out to be just to take that as an example to see how the philosophical bit and the scientific bit would combine. So suppose we find out, you know, we completely proved that 
maximal integrated information is correlated with biological consciousness, then combined with this hybrid cosmopsychic view, you have an, an emergence law and an, and an inheritance law. So you have an emergence law that there is an emergent subject corresponding to location L, if and only if, that I, F, double F means if and only if, there is more phi in L considered as a whole than in any parts of L. So that's just a fundamental law of nature. And then an inheritance law that emergent subjects inherit those aspects of experience from the level of fundamental physics within L that support high levels of phi. Right, so, so, so that's how the two would fit together. Just what, one quick advantage of, of IAT I've been um, thinking about recently. What, one thing I like about it is, is that it, 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 it potentially gives non-vague, combined with this view, it potentially gives non-vague laws. These emergence laws and inheritance laws would be non-vague because um, you know it, it could be an utter, in vague in the technical philosophical sense that there's no, uh, there's an utterly sharp cutoff point, as opposed to, for example, being tall. There's no utterly sharp cutoff point for someone being tall. There are both fuzzy borderline cases, but it could in principle be an utterly sharp cutoff point when suddenly there's more phi in the whole than the parts. And I like that because on this view, there are fundamental laws of nature. And it's weird to think, I think, that fundamental laws of nature might be vague. And also, I think consciousness is not vague. I don't think there can ever be... Um, it can ever be a borderline case where something is kind of conscious or I think I have something, there's that something is either conscious or it's not. We could argue about that maybe. So on the global workspace theory, it looks like it's going to be a lot more vague, the borderlines between consciousness and non-consciousness. So why would this be an attractive view? Um, so the thought is we, we do definitely, I hope, on, on, on the hybrid cosmopsychic view, avoid the problems of materialism and dualism. Um, we close the expansionary gap. How do we do that? Because we just got these basic laws of nature that determine A, that there are emergent subjects and B, which streams of consciousness they inherit from the fundamental subjects. Um, and B, this can fit, un unlike potentially dualism, this can fit the empirical data. So I think a lot of the worries of dualism is, is the thought that um, Conscious systems don't seem to obey different laws of nature to non-conscious systems. And you think if dualism was true, and there's this, you know, this radically new thing, consciousness in brains, you think they ought to behave really differently. Whereas on this view, because of the reductionist bit, because my, my mind doesn't come with brand new forms of consciousness, it just inherits streams of consciousness from the fundamental level, uh, you wouldn't expect it to behave very differently. So I think we get the prediction on this theory that it can accommodate the empirical fact that systems involving emergent subjects obey the same as systems which don't because they, there's no radically new properties. They're just inheriting forms of consciousness from the fundamental level. So they ought, they ought to be, behave just the same. So that's, that's the view I've been, I've been defending, you know, it, and the hope is it can evolve, avoid the expansionary gap and the empirical worries of dualism. So we'd have a theory that is empirically adequate and, you know, avoids the expansionary gap. Final slide. I just want to share some more recent thoughts I've been having. Firstly, so the view I just described, there are no emergent forms of consciousness. Humans don't pop up with new forms of consciousness. They just, you know, inherit forms of consciousness from the fundamental level. But I suspect actually that there must be for philosophical reasons, there must be emergent forms of consciousness because I'm one of the growing minority of analytic philosophers who believe in cognitive phenomenology, think there's a distinctive kind of consciousness involved in thought. Um, surprisingly, most analytic philosophers think thought has nothing to do with consciousness, which strikes many as strange, but that's still probably the dominant view. And, and I think those kinds of consciousness, I don't think, I think they must be in some sense radically new and also I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more into sort of strong views of rational agency. So in some sense, there must be new causal powers. I'm also, and this is what I want to ask the scientists about and anyone else, of course, I'm becoming more, more skeptical that we do have empirical grounds um, for, for, for the causal closure view that many philosophers accept. So the, the, the typical analytic philosopher objection to dualism is if there were non-physical properties having some influence in the brain, 
it would really show up in our neuroscience. You know, there'd be all sorts of things happening in the brain that we had no physical explanation for. And we, we just don't see that. But I recently, I mean, more the more I'd read neuroscience, talk to neuroscience, and I, I've just read the, the Idea of the Brain by Matthew Cobb, sort of scientific history of the brain. Now, the impression I got from that, and, and I really love the scientist's views on this, the impression I got from that is, we know a lot about the kind of basic chemistry of the brain. We know a lot about large scale functions. What we're really clueless on is how large scale functions are realized at the neuronal level. The, you know, those sort of how it works questions. Now, if that's the case, then it seems to me we're just not in a position to know whether there are non-physical influences here, like David Chalmers might suppose, or, or just new causal principles, new laws of nature. We'd have to know a lot more about the workings of the brain, how large scale functions are realized at the cellular level to be able to judge that question. So I'm becoming increasingly skeptical with that empirical argument against both dualism and strong emergentist panpsychism. panpsychism. So that's opening me up to thinking, not going for the purest version of my view, where there are no new forms of consciousness, radically emergent forms of consciousness at the biological level. So why would you go for my theory? And this is my final point. Well, I still think my theory offers a more empirically flexible model than dualist theory. Because if you have a dualist theory, um, all the powers of human consciousness are totally extra to the powers of physical properties. And that's just, you've just got, if you're a dualist, whatever consciousness does is totally extra to what the physical does. That's a prediction of the theory, but it's a very rigid prediction. Whereas on my view, it could still be that many of my conscious states and their causal powers are shared with conscious states at the level of physics. So as I'm imagining it, that there would be, you know, some new forms of consciousness in the, hum in the human brain to do with sophisticated conscious thought, to do with rational agency, perhaps. But there would be a lot of the consciousness would be just inherited from the level of fundamental physics. So you wouldn't see necessarily see kind of ma massive changes in the causal workings of the brain than you would in a, of course, there's differences in a functioning brain to a dead brain. But I'm talking about the causal, gen the laws of nature at play here. You wouldn't see, you know, massive difference in laws of nature. I suspect so. So there's different. So in other words, dualism has less empirical flexibility. I suspect we we don't know enough about the brain to be able to assess these predictions anyway. But as we move forward, it's nice to have a theory that's more empirically flexible. So um, I'll skip the, the the spirituality stuff and conclusions. So I think there is a scientific bit of the problem of consciousness tracking NCC and a philosophical bit explaining NCC. I think materialism doesn't work and dualism is profligate and empirically inflexible. Um, hybrid panpsychism offers a coherent and empirically flexible account of the NCC. And I, you know, I really want to see I, my ideal, and this is just for my philosophical view, would be you know, scientists and philosophers coming together to bring together the empirical and the scientific bit, as Hedda Hassel-Merck has done with IIT, for example, uh, or started to do. And, um, oh, then there's the bit about mystical experiences, which, which I didn't get onto. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening.